A year ago, the coronavirus pandemic crept into the United States after taking a devastating toll across the globe. The early U.S. outbreak was centered in Washington state, just miles away from Microsoft's headquarters. There, CEO Satya Nadella made the call that a significant number of the company's 168,000 employees could work from home. Now, his focus is shifting to not just keeping employees safe, but keeping them engaged with the rise of Microsoft's chat product, Teams, and a new offering called Viva. This, as Microsoft's stock has continued to rise, up more than 500 percent during his seven years at the helm, after languishing for more than a decade under his predecessors. He shared this key guidance with us three years ago. It's not about changing everything, it's about changing what needs to be changed, and therein lies the trick, so to speak. Since then, Microsoft's market cap has crossed $1 trillion, now closing in on $2 trillion. But with big tech scrutiny ramping up in Washington and rising tech competition in China, Nadella's next seven years at Microsoft will be just as critical. Joining me on this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. Sacha, thank you so much for doing this. It's so great to have you. No, thank you so much, Emily, for having me. It's great to be with you. The pandemic has underscored the power of technology in helping companies and governments and families get through this. And Microsoft Teams has been a huge part of that and has been an incredible growth story. Give us a snapshot of just how much Teams has grown through the pandemic. We talk a lot about remote work, but the reality is more than 50% of the workforce, whether it is in healthcare or in retail or critical manufacturing, uh, had to be uh, in the, at the site. And so one of the things that really got upended across industries was how do you connect people? So if you have someone on the front lines and then an engineer perhaps working from home, how do you connect? So the team's growth was not just about knowledge workers collaborating, but it was in fact really helping frontline workers and knowledge workers come together to keep business continuity and our society and our economy going. In fact, I shudder to think even what the economic activity would have been or what the state of services that we all you know, you know, have today would have been, but for the state of uh, today's technologies uh, and that cloud architecture and teams clearly has been a massive growth story for us, but it's mostly because of the context of the constraints and how to overcome them. Now you're on to what you believe will be your next massive line of business, employee experience. Tell us about your newest product, Microsoft Viva. The thing that the pandemic has put uh, really uh, sh shine the light on is how important the experience for the employees is, right? I mean, when you're remote in particular, you want to be staying engaged with your business and your company and its sense of purpose and mission. You want to be able to collaborate, like as I said, between the folks on the front lines and the knowledge workers. Uh, you want to be able to actually start learning, say, as a new employee I join, how do I build that knowledge capital by learning from others when I don't have some of the same social structures of the workplace? I need to be able to find them online, learn from them, uh, as well as the learning content needs to be delivered more in the you know, the, the uh, workflow tools I use every day. We've had to introduce even things like virtual commutes and so on in order to help people with transition. So putting these things all together, the employee engagement, learning, collaboration, and well-being uh, into one experience platform is what Viva is all about. Uh, and I think that this represents a new category creation moment. Uh, if you look at what we've, the journey we've been on with Microsoft 365, we started with individual tools, it became a collaboration suite, uh, and now we think it's going to really get into a new space around employee experience, more holistically thinking about productivity, not just narrowly as output, but all of learning and well-being and collaboration. So if you spend your whole day in Teams or Word or Outlook, are you putting all of those in one place? Is that what that would mean for the user? In fact, it's not. It's the exact opposite, which is to say use the tool that you're using for, for example, any of your communication needs or deep work needs. And then in the context of that, let us bring in the other people you want to work with, the learning content that's going to make you more productive, uh, the well-being nudges you need in order to make sure that you have the transition. So that's the main purpose of an employee experience is to not introduce one more new experience that you need to 
go to, mm -hmm. but to bring an experience that you need in the tools that you're using every day as part of your work. Could this be your next $10 billion business? What's the total addressable market? I believe with EXP is, you know, HR software is there, or HCM, or human capital management software is there, but it's more about really tying what happens in the HR or people operations to the entirety of the business, right? Whether it's in finance, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in engineering. And so we think that this can be, like in the years to come, in the decades to come, we'll talk about it like a CRM or an ERP class category. You have been very outspoken about how employee experience is suffering in the work from home environment. Uh, Microsoft Teams data showing we're all taking more meetings, more chats, more ad hoc calls, more chats on the weekends as well. What concerns you so much about working from home and, and this remote work period as it drags on? I would say my main thing is to not just uh, have some new dogma about any one type of work, right? The reality is uh, everything, in fact, coming out of this crisis perhaps, or this pandemic, we're all going to recognize the importance of flexibility. There is uh, real reasons why people may want to work from home, uh, but it might be in different times in diff you know, for different people. It will be different by geography. It'll be different by uh, business function. And so we need, at least from a workplace policy perspective, as well as the infrastructure and the tooling perspective, build for that flexibility. So we cannot assume remote everything for all time to come or all things have to happen only in the workplace. Uh, so I more fall into the camp of let's make sure that we have built in to both the policies and the infrastructure and the tools maximum flexibility because none of us, I think, will, will want to be constrained anymore, whether it's by the place or the time or the location even. What's been the hardest part of work from home for you personally as a leader trying to run this massive I think, company? I think for me it's been, you know, the social capital that gets built, uh, you know, in so many different ways when you're able to see the body language, you're able to learn from the cues people uh, by watching people. Uh, and some of that social capital is hard to create. Sometimes meetings can become very transactional. Uh, so to me, that's probably been the hardest. Uh, I'm not saying but that, that, that therefore we should sort of think that somehow remote work is inferior. As I said, there are times when you know, remote work can be very productive. And, uh, but at the same time, I think we need to bring in more innovation, uh, like together more than others, to start even bridging the social capital creation uh, capabilities. Do you think work from home could be stifling innovation? Is it stifling innovation? In fact, we're, we're studying, we're collecting a lot of data, and the reality is, uh, let's take our game studios, right? The one place where we've seen some challenges is uh, that the game studios do have a tough time in uh, work from home to be able to bring people together to, in fact, collaborate, in fact, watch other gamers to get the inspiration to create new content. So clearly, there are some places where the innovation does take a hit. But at the same time, when I look at what's happening with some of the data around GitHub, it's fascinating to see how the world has come together even more so in the open source side to create critical software for very and innovate together. So I wouldn't say there's just one answer. So if anything I'm taking away is every there needs to be some structural change perhaps wherever there has been an impediment to creativity or innovation. Uh, one has to go back and ask, what is that structural change that will allow us, quite frankly, the next time there's another tail event and we have to work uh, remotely or in, with other constraints, how can we continue to innovate? So I think that all, all the solution uh, for every function and every industry is not there today, but I think there will be. What do you think it is that the tech industry is doing wrong? Or are they too big, too powerful, and abusing that power? I don't think big by itself is bad, or but competition is good. The unintended consequences of your scale cannot be dealt after the fact. They need to be dealt while you're scaling. It's been seven years almost to the day as we tape this that you took over as CEO. And since then, the stock has soared over 500% after languishing for more than a decade, crossed a $1 trillion market cap. 
if you could pick one thing, what do you think is the single most important thing that you did right? <laughs> it's actually stunning to me that seven years have passed. Um, I, if I had to sort of, you know, I, I, having grown up at Microsoft, uh, perhaps even on day one when I started, uh, of course it was a completely new job. I now recognize that, you know, the responsibility of being a CEO is different even that from one step removed. Uh, but I came at it, I think, Emily, from that sense of pride in what this company represented for, you know, uh, in the world. Uh, I always felt that I joined Microsoft because of its mission, so reinforcing perhaps that mission, sense of purpose, and then having this culture of being the learn-it-alls uh, has probably been the most important thing uh, because they're, they're very talented people. Uh, the opportunity, whether it was cloud or other technologies, was clear. And I think in any company, you know, you have to go back to the very basics of why do you exist? And if you don't exist, will anybody miss you? Being able to ask those questions and answer those questions and having a culture that even allows you to really honestly answer those questions is the most important thing. And, uh, and as an insider at Microsoft, I always felt uh, that. And so that is what I started with. And that's what I start even my seventh year with. What advice would this Satya Nadella give that Satya Nadella seven years ago? I mean, the thing that perhaps was the steepest learning curve for me um, as CEO was understanding what does it mean to have multiple constituents, uh, right? I mean, people talk about, oh, it's about customers, it's about employees, it's about investors, it's about other stakeholders. And today, of course, uh, multi-stakeholder capitalism is the topic that everybody's talking about. But understanding, what, as a CEO, what does that mean? How do you really grapple with it? And it can't be something that I, I'll divide my week into multiple stakeholders, right, in equal uh, quantities. It's about harmonizing that into the core of your business model as well as your operations of, as a business. Uh, that's probably been the thing uh, that I would say, having a framework for it. I feel fantastic about the work uh, the entire team at Microsoft has done around it, right? Uh, because you need to have a business model fundamentally where when you do well, the world around you is doing well. If that is broken, it's very hard to fix. Uh, even if you have business performance, but if the world around you, because of your business performance, is not doing well, that's a social contract that you cannot be put back together. So I would say uh, that's the advice I would give any CEO is to ask, and you know, it's something that it's also got to be managed every day. It's not something you take for granted. Now, you're now on your third administration, uh, U.S. presidential administration as CEO of Microsoft. If there was one thing you want this administration to do that would make a difference for Microsoft, what would it be? I think for, quite frankly, for this administration and the last administration, right now the most important thing is how do we get uh, past this pandemic, uh, because even as we speak, if you think about some of the big challenges we have around even the core logistics of delivering the vaccines, the vaccine supply chain. So I feel the private sector needs to do its job and do it super well. We have many capabilities, but even the government needs to do its job. And it's really, I think, if anything, we have all come to recognize the strength in our institutions in the private sector, and in the public sector, and how they all both need to be coordinated and stitched together. And quite frankly, governments are the most capable coordinating agencies we have. Uh, and we just need that and more of that going forward. The power of big tech is being scrutinized by regulators around the world, lawmakers around the world, and regular people around the world. What do you think it is that the tech industry is doing wrong that makes so many people Wonder, are they too big, too powerful, and abusing that power? I would say a couple of things. Big by itself is not bad, but competition is good. Uh, and more importantly, it's not just competition, but it's that point I made earlier, which is you need to have a business model uh, that really is aligned with the world doing well. Uh, I think that's what's being litigated, right, which is there are certain categories uh, of products where the unintended consequences uh, of the growth on that category or lack of competition in it 
uh, creates issues. And so that's what I think people are all looking at and saying, hey, what's the fix for that? Uh, but I don't think big by itself is bad, or but competition is good. And every business, in particular the businesses that are large and have high scale, the unintended consequences of your scale cannot be dealt after the fact. They need to be dealt while you're scaling. So when it comes to the deplatforming of, of President Trump, for example, should a Facebook or a Twitter or Google or YouTube or Twitch have the power to say who we can and cannot hear from? And if not, who should? Yeah, I mean, this is another one of those places where I think unilateral action uh, by individual companies in democracies like ours is just not, I think, long-term stable. Uh, we do need to be able to have framework of laws and norms, uh, which are societal norms, around even internet safety uh, and what is uh, the public square that really is in alignment with a thriving democracy. So we just need to get to a stable state uh, in that, because otherwise, depending on any one individual CEO in any one of these companies to make calls that are going to really help us maintain something as sacred and as important as our democracy in the long run is just no way at least I as a citizen would advocate for. Now, Slack has alleged that Microsoft combining Teams into Office is anti-competitive. Um, what's your response to that? How does the landscape change now that Slack has been bought by Salesforce and is part of this bigger entity? I think both Slack and Salesforce have been successful. Uh, for example, I always point out that when we think about what they were able to do, I always ask the question, would Slack have even existed if it was not for the free access they had on top of, say, the Windows platform? They didn't have to call Microsoft. They didn't have to go through any of our app stores. They didn't have need any uh, or, you know, of our permission uh, compared to any of the other platforms that they're available on. We perhaps provide the most open platform in Windows and even on Office 365. You can, in fact, use all of the APIs that we expose, integrate with any application, uh, and people use it. If you look at even the usage reports, there's Slack usage and Microsoft 365 usage. So, and same thing with Salesforce. So the fact that they're combining will compete with them, and they will also cooperate with them and provide them uh, access to our platforms. And I think they should measure it by what type of success they've had on top of our platform. You worked at Microsoft through its own antitrust battles. You remember what that was like. It's been called the, the lost decade, if you will. What cultural risks do you believe these companies face, even if they're not broken up? What's happening on the inside as these investigations play out? I don't know if there are real parallels between what happened with Microsoft and any of them, but I would say I think the core, as I, I always go back, is you know, if you have a business and a business model where when you are doing well, around you people are doing well, uh, and that is something that your own employees feel, then I think things will work out culturally. When that is not true, I think it's very, very hard. Uh, because one of the things I feel is, as somebody said, you got to keep it simple. Uh, what you say, what you do, and what you think all need to be consistent. You can't sort of have uh, real distance between those three things. And that's what at least would be my advice and, uh, to anybody, in, in starting with ourselves. Why did you want to buy TikTok? I think TikTok's achieved a lot of success in being able to take a new media format uh, like short form video uh, and create a very interesting property. What are your biggest concerns about a rising tech industry in China? I think that, first of all, there is no God-given right uh, for the, say, U.S. tech companies to take for granted that there cannot be other uh, tech powers and tech spheres. So if anything, uh, rising competition in the world, whether it's from Europe, whether it's from China or the rest of Asia, is something that I think all of us even, quote unquote, in the West Coast of the United States need to be more grounded in. Because sometimes I think we celebrate our own uh, advances far too much, uh, and we should be more looking to saying what's happening in the world and how relevant is our technology in the world. So from that perspective, I'm a more big believer that the world does better when there is real competition across the globe and there is more technology that then is diffused throughout. 
That said, national security concerns are real concerns. Uh, and that's for nation states to really, you know, legislate on. Uh, but I think uh, for private companies like ours, we should be thinking about how, our, how good is our technology, how useful is our technology around the world, and welcome competition wherever it's coming from. Microsoft tried to buy TikTok and it didn't happen. Why did you want to buy TikTok? You know, it's, 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 I think TikTok's achieved a lot of success in being able to take a new media format uh, like short form video. Uh, and create a very interesting property. Uh, we had a very crisp vision of, for what we would want to do with it, uh, and including, for example, addressing some of the very real concerns around national security. But that was last summer, and we moved on. Would you be interested in, in other social media properties? We today have, Emily, whether it's Minecraft or Xbox Live or LinkedIn or even GitHub, uh, because it, it is you know, one of the things perhaps that's not uh, as well understood in the world is we do have some very high scale uh, prop communities and properties like that that we are engaged in making sure, for example, what does internet safety look like? How does the quality of the dialogue on the LinkedIn platform? What's moderation on Xbox Live look like? Uh, how can we even think about GitHub uh, and uh, making sure that that community is thriving? So to me, I'm very, very focused on the properties we have, scaling them and scaling them without these unintended consequences, uh, in particular around internet safety. Microsoft is now teaming up with GM and Cruise to commercialize self-driving cars. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit more about what we'll see here in terms of Microsoft's mobility play. It's actually an interesting combination of GM uh, that is an incumbent and Cruise uh, that is a new entrant, both relying and depending on Microsoft's cloud computing technology to build their own uh, computing platforms. And that's what we want to replicate, quite frankly, broadly in the auto industry, as well as in other industries, because we think that the model that at least I have uh, is that this is not about one vertically integrated company called Microsoft. It's about digital technology being much more evenly spread across every tech industry. I mean, every industry becoming more like a digital tech industry. And that's what we are, right. you know, intend to do even with these partnerships. We're seeing a huge pushback against the establishment and centralized power, whether it is the capital riot or individual investors driving up the price of GameStop or the unionization of tech employees. Do you see it as a fundamental shift in power from institutions to individuals? And how will these trends inform your next seven years as the CEO a, of Microsoft? It's a great, it's a great question, Emily. And you know, I, 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 you know, sort of, in some sense, I'm still learning what this shift looks like. But I would say the core principle of institutions and institutional strength that fundamentally distributes power is a good thing. It's a, that's kind of what democracies were all about. I mean, fundamentally, democracies were about institutions that actually distributed power. So any institution that centralizes power will have more challenges in the long run because they won't be as resilient as distributed power. So from that principle perspective, I think that we can take perhaps a lot of hope from what's happening. But we'll also have to watch how this plays out so that we really make sure that now we don't swing from one to the other only to sort of recognize that there needs to be more thought given to how we transform. Sachin Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0. Thank you so much, Emily.